Good day, this is Job Aguas and welcome to my lectures in philosophy. This is part of my lectures in phenomenology and existentialism. And in this lecture, I will be focusing on the philosophy of Gabriel Marcel. Introduction Gabriel Marcel was born on December 7, 1889 in Paris to Henri and Laure Marcel. His father was a civil servant and served as a privy counselor and French ambassador to Sweden. He was also the director of Beau Art of the Bibliothèque Nationale and Musée National. Gabriel Marcel's mother was Jewish, and this route to the Jewish faith and tradition would influence Marcel's understanding of human cruelty, particularly against the Jews during the Holocaust. His mother though died when he was only four years old and he was taken care of by his father and an aunt and the two would later get married. His stepmother was a woman of strong ethical conviction and provided Gabriel Marcel the only religious influence in his life. Marcel's father was generally secular, probably agnostic. Henri did not permit discussion of religion in the household, and later Gabriel Marcel would suggest that this, this lack of religion in his father's house is the reason why religion became a personal fascination for him. Marcel enjoyed the privilege of systematic education. He had his secondary education at the Lacey Carnot. And later on, he went to Sorbonne to study philosophy. He excelled in school, but he did so without enjoying his studies prior to his encounter with philosophy. Marcel's earlier philosophical thinking was influenced by the abstract thinking of idealism, particularly by the idealism of Bradley, Royce, and Bergson. But later on, he turned around and revolted against idealism and concerned himself with the concrete lived human experience. After passing the aggregation, the final examination, Marcel received his doctorate in philosophy from the Sorbonne in 1910. After that, he taught philosophy intermittently in Sens, Paris, and Montpellier. However, his main professional occupations were that of a drama critic for Le Roux Novel and later on for Nouvelle Littéraire. And he also served as editor for the Fou Croissant series at Plon. Because of health problems, Marcel relocated to Switzerland in, 12, in 1912, where he may have sought care and rest at various spas and health clinics, which was very common at the time. While resting physically, Marcel began writing his journal Metaphysique, or his Metaphysical Journal, which would be published in 1927. He associated with many of the prominent philosophers of his day, partly because of his hosting of the famous Friday evenings. Some of the noted philosophers during the time who attended these gatherings one, one time or another were Paul Ricoeur, Emmanuel Levinas, Jean Wall, and Jean Paul Sartre. These informal gatherings were an occasion to engage uh, thinkers from a variety of perspectives and philosophical backgrounds to discuss various philosophical themes uh, that were being talked about or discussed during the time. During World War I, Marcel served with the Red Cross. World War I, or the First World War, is sometimes described as the worst war or worse than World War II. New technologies and horrific uh, weapons left battlefields barren of all life. These images of cruelty and destruction influence Marcel and most other European writers to write about the horrific human conditions 
during the war. He became obsessed with issues of death and immortality. He wondered what happened to the essence of men who were killed in battle. His experiences during the war made him develop his great regard for the human person, for the fellow human beings, and for interpersonal relationships. As a liaison officer for the Red Cross, Marcel was called upon to comfort the relatives of missing, captured, or killed soldiers, notifying families that their loved ones have been killed or are missing or captured affected Marcel so much. While with the Red Cross, Marcel began to write his first play, The Invisible Sun. And Marcel will write more than 20 plays during his life. After the war, Marcel married Jacqueline Bogner, and he taught at the secondary school in Paris. It was in these early wedded years that Marcel became engaged as a playwright, philosopher, and literary critic. The couple continued to travel, and they adopted a son, Jean-Marie, and Marcel developed friendships with important thinkers of the day. Some biographers suggest that Gabriel Marcel introduced the works of Kierkegaard and Franz in a 1925 essay published in Revue de Metaphysique. For Marcel, Kierkegaard seemed to be writing about the anxieties experienced by all individuals. While searching for meaning and thinking about Kierkegaard, Marcel attended Protestant services. Manuel, uh, Marcel joined the ranks of Christian existentialists while working as a drama critic for Le Roup Nouvelle. Following a favorable review of a work by Francois Mauriac, a Catholic friend, Marcel received a note from the author, Mauriac, and Mauriac invited and asked Marcel, Come, Marcel, why are you not one of us? Marcel would later join the Catholic Church on March 23, 1929, at the age of 39. After his conversion, he found the fundamental answers to his basic questions that have been haunting him since childhood, and consequently, he made religion, revelation, and spirituality the basis of his philosophy. He would remain a defender of Catholic faith until his death. His literary talents earned him many intellectual and literary honors he was awarded the Grand Prix de Literature of the French Academy in 1948, the Gitte Prize in 1956, and the Grand Prix National de Lettres in 1958. He gave the Gifford Lectures at Aberdeen between 1949 and 1950, and the William James Lectures of the Harvard University in 1961. His deeply held religious beliefs would later conflict with trends among the French left. While the French left was embracing atheism and Marxist ideals, Marcel was developing a different view of freedom. For Marcel, freedom was demonstrated by a respect for and love of other individuals. The truly free would understand the rights of all men had to be defended to deserve personal freedom. Marcel interviewed many French victims of the Nazi concentration camps following the Second World War and wrote several works based on these interviews. Marcel died of heart attack on October 8, 1973. Now let's go to his philosophical legacy and methodology. Marcel's philosophical legacy includes lectures, journal entries, and dramatic works, in addition, of course, to the more orthodox philosophical expressions in essays. 
Of these various genres, Marcel was perhaps most pleased with his dramatic works. But it was his philosophical works that earned him, he, uh, earned him attention while his dramatic works were relatively obscure. Complicating the diverse expression of his ideas is the fact that Marcel was a consciously unsystematic philosopher, something he realized as early as the publication of his metaphysical journal in 1927. Nevertheless, while the diverse expression of his thought and the relative or related lack of uh, systematic, uh, uh, systematicity uh, would cause some difficulty for those interested to study his philosophy and his works, the main themes of his thoughts are present in many of his works, and especially noteworthy are the mystery of being, creative fidelity, homo viator, being and having, tragic wisdom and beyond the concise on the ontological mystery and of course his metaphysical journal. Marcel introduced into French philosophy in his essays, Existence and Objectivity, written in 1925, and in his metaphysical journal, many of the themes, existential themes, that would later become central to existentialism. He used an independently developed phenomenological method and dealt with such themes as participation, incarnation, man as being in the world, and the priority of existence over abstractions, or the cogito, as a starting point of philosophy. Marcel's philosophical methodology was rather unique, although it bears some resemblance to both existentialism and phenomenology. His fellow existentialists insisted that his philosophy begins with concrete experience rather than abstractions. To serve this view, he made constant use of examples in order to ground his philosophical ideas or his philosophical reflections um, to human experience, the ideas that he is investigating. According to Marcel, the method itself consists in working up, working up from life to thought and then down from thought to life again, meaning from thought to experience. So you start from experience to thought and then apply your thoughts to experience. Thus he described philosophy as a sort of description bearing upon the structures which reflection elucidates starting from experience. And perhaps we can see this in his constant reference to his dramatic works because his dramatic works concretize they concretize the philosophical thoughts that he expressed in his philosophical works. In addition, Marcel expressed a refreshing preference for philosophizing in ordinary language, using ordinary words. He maintained that we should employ current forms of ordinary language, which distort our experience far less than the elaborate expressions in which philosophical language is crystallized. So instead of using abstract language, uh, Marcel preferred to use ordinary language to express his ideas and his thoughts. Marcel's critique of idealism and his defense of faith resemble Kierkegaard's critique of Hegel. Marcel, however, does not consider faith as an irrational leap unlike Kierkegaard, or that the individual alone stands alone in his faith. Like Heidegger, he explores much of the same terrain in seeking to restore the ontological weight to human experience. You can see this in being and having. 
They share a common view of the nature of truth and language. Marcel, however, unlike Heidegger, includes within his ontology the assurance of fulfillment that is part of faith's apprehension of God as absolute presence. So in this sense, Marcel is similar to Martin Buber in the recognition of God as an absolute presence. In the words of Martin Buber, God as the eternal Tao. In many ways, Martin Buber has been Marcel's closest contemporary and philosophical relative. Each has independently developed a philosophy of dialogue and communion in which the distinction between I, thou relation, and I, it relation plays a central part. Marcel's philosophical explorations cannot be separated from his dramatic writings or from his experimentation in music. His plays are not philosophical in the sense that uh, being the presentation of work out ideas. Like what his fellow existentialists did, his plays present complicated situations in which persons find themselves find themselves trapped in that situation, challenged and confused, and therefore indirectly they explore the nature of the exile into which the soul enters as it becomes alienated from itself, from those it loves, and even from God. Marcel believes that in music, one finds a foretaste or presentiment of the perfect harmony and communion toward which all authentic human existence strives. Philosophy shares both in the tension and that in the essence of drama and in the harmony which is the essence of music. Now let's go to the first philosophical concept that we will discuss. Man as incarnate subjectivity, perhaps one of the most important concepts of Gabriel Marcel. Existentialists like Marcel considers man as a subject. As a subject, man is a wellspring of initiative. He has his own thoughts, his intentions, his wishes, his desires, and all these inner things coming from his own interiority. But this inner core of man must be expressed. And man expresses this inner core, this interiority, this subjectivity through his body. His body incarnates or puts into flesh his desires, his intentions, his wishes, his thoughts, his aspirations, even his fears. That's why it is the body that puts into flesh this subjectivity. For Marcel, man is essentially incarnate. And the only way we can exist in the world and think about the world and relate with the world and with others is by being incarnate, by being a body by being embodied. This means that we need to appear as a body. And although my body or my incarnation presents, uh, makes me present in the world, it does not make my body just an object or any object or an instrument that can be manipulated or can be used by the self. Because the body expresses a subjectivity. It is subjectivity. For Marcel, there's no gap between the body and the self. There's no separation between my body and myself. My body incarnates myself, exteriorizes, manifests myself. So it is the body that puts into action or externalizes the self. It is the body that expresses the subjectivity. And therefore, the body is not just something. 
something external to the self, like some kind of an object. It is rather an essential component that is deeply connected to the subject. It is not just something. It is part of the person's being somebody. Hence, there should be no objectification of the body. I am my body insofar as I succeed in recognizing that this body of mine cannot be brought down to the level of being this object, an object that can be manipulated. It is through the body that I become present to the world and to others. It is through the body that I relate with others. The awareness of my body becomes the awareness of my being and others. And therefore, the incarnate subject is not an isolated subject, but an intersubjective self. We're going to discuss on that in the later part of the lecture. Now, let's go to another concept of Gabriel Marcel, the broken world. One of Marcel's central comments about life and experience is that we live in a broken world. A world in which ontological exigence is silenced by an unconscious relativism or by a monism that discounts the personal. It is a world that ignores the tragic and denies the transcendent, the beyond. The world we live in is essentially broken, broken in essence, and further fractured by events in history, especially the immediate history that Gabriel Marcel experienced during the war. According to Marcel, the world has lost its real unity. But what is this broken world that Marcel is talking about? According to Marcel, this situation of being broken, the world being broken, is characterized by a refusal or in the inability to reflect. A refusal to imagine and a denial of the transcendent. In ordinary individuals, the sense of the ontological, meaning the sense of being, the sense of the mysterious, the sense of the transcendent, the sense of the mystery, is lacking. Men have lost the awareness of the sense of being. Men have lost awareness of the sense of the ontological. The capacity to wonder has atrophied. It has dried out to the extent of becoming an irrelevant and superficial trait. So for Marcel, man no longer reflects on his condition. He never, he no longer reflects about the condition of the world. And this is the very cause of the world being broken. There are many things that contribute to the brokenness of the world, but the hallmark of its modern manifestation is the misplacement of the idea of function. Misplacement of the idea of function. And function are the things that we regularly do to accomplish some task, some things. But apparently for Marcel, it means that we have lost sight of the very meaning of our own existence because of our focus on our functions. And he gives this example of the influence of the misplacement of the idea of function. He cites the function of a subway token distributor. In the train, in the subway, somebody behind the token counter distributes or gives the tokens to the passenger. So this subway token distributor, according to Marcel, 
has a job that is mindless, repetitive, monotonous. Every day, he or she comes to his area and distributes the tokens, gets the payment, gives the token. So, the same function can in fact be, and often is, completed by automated machines. So, this token collect this token distributor is actually doing a function that can be performed by a machine. All day this person takes bills from commuters, payment, and returns a token and some chains, repeating the same process with the same denominations of currency over and over for the whole day. The other people with whom she or he interacts engage her in only the most superficial and distant manner. In fact, the only distinction, in most cases, they do not speak. They do not speak to her. And they do not make any eye contact. They are focused on their payment and on the token. And the token distributor is also focused on the payment and the token. In fact, the only distinction the commuter makes between this person and the machine is that the mechanical dispenser down the hall or somewhere in the in the area uh, has a much shorter line or more efficient than the person behind or the subway token distributor. The way in which this Commuters interact with the subway employee, the distributor, is clearly superficial and less than desirable. The tedious work slowly becomes infuriating in its monotony. Then it passes into a necessity that is accepted with indifference until even the sense of dissatisfaction with the pure functionalism of the task is lost. Individuals may come to see themselves first unconsciously as merely amalgamation of the functions. There is the function of dispensing tokens at work. There is also the function of a spouse and parent at home, the function of a voting uh, of a citizen to vote, the function of a teacher, public servant, function of a driver, function of a helper, a government official, etc. So life is but a series of timetables that indicate when certain functions, such as the regular going to the market, the church, check up to the doctor, the yearly vacation, are to be exercised. Even in our time, the function of teaching, the function of studying, they become monotonous. And we have become indifferent to, mono to the monotony of this function. Marcel stressed that the sense of wonder and the experience for the transcendent has slowly begun to wither and die because of the misplacement of our function. In the worst cases, a person who has become, who has come to identify herself or with, or himself with his or her functions, ceases to even have any intuition that the world for him is already broken. Life is but a series of amalgamations of functions. Pure functionality is the essence of a broken world. And are we not in the same world right now during the pandemic? We are so concerned with our functions that we have lost sight or we don't have that sense of wonder anymore. We no longer reflect on what the very meaning of our existence or the very meaning of what we are doing. Corollary to the functionalism of the modern 
broken world is the highly technical nature of this world. Marcel characterized our world as one that is dominated by its techniques. And this is evident in the dependence on technology, the immediate deferral to the technological as the answer to any problem, and the tendency to think of technical reasoning as the only mode of access to the truth. However, according to Marcel, there are some problems that cannot be addressed by technique. And this is disappointing for persons who have come to rely on techniques. While technology undoubtedly has its proper place and use, the deification of technology leads to despair. When we realize the ultimate and efficacy of techniques, Regarding important existential questions, according to Marcel, it is precisely this misapplication of the idea of functions and the dependence on techniques that leads to the despair that is so prevalent in the broken world. Now let's go to the next concept, ontological exigency and transcendence. According to Marcel, what defines man is his exigencies. That is, those concerns that are pressing and urgent. Those concerns that cannot be passed up. Exigencies can be mundane or transcendental. However, these exigencies can be smothered and even be silenced by despair. Like the case of the functionalized person. The broken world can smoother or transcend our transcendent exigencies, leaving only the mundane functional needs intact. Because we live in a functionalized, highly functionalized broken world, we need to overcome its disunity by focusing on our transcendental exigencies. But what is a transcendental exigency? For Marcel, the need for transcendence is linked to a certain dissatisfaction. One that is all the more troubling because one is unable to soothe this dissatisfaction by one's powers. However, without a feeling that something is amiss, that there's something lacking in our lives with the, the feeling of dissatisfaction, ontological exigence withers. It dries up. This is why the functional person, the person who no longer even notices that the world is broken, is described as having lost the awareness of the ontological in the need for transcendence. And that is the worst thing that could happen to the functional man when he is no longer aware of the ontological and the need for transcendence. So in the face of this potential despair, being or the ontological is necessary. We need to reflect. We need to stop, meditate about being. Ontological exigence is a need and a demand for some level of coherence in the cosmos and for some understanding of our place and role within this coherence. It is the combination of wonder and the attendant desire not to understand the entire cosmos, but to understand something of one's own place in this cosmos, our place in this world. To transcend is not merely to go beyond. In spatio-temporal dimensions, more importantly, transcendence is the state of or quality of surmounting or rising above the ordinary limits of our existence, to go beyond the limits of our ordinary existence. 
it's not necessary to go beyond the spatiotemporal dimension. For Marcel, transcendence is exigent, meaning it is pressing, it is urgent, it is something that you cannot ignore, something that you can pass up. No, this exigency is intrinsic to the human condition. It means that if you need to reflect upon or about your existence, it must be now. It is something that cannot be postponed. It is pressing and urgent. So Marcel clarified that transcendence is not a state of being or being transcendence, transcendent of experience. It is actually to immerse in transcendence. So to the contrary, the transcendent is capable of being experienced. So it's not to go out of something, out of this uh, spatial temporal dimension. It is to remain within this temporal dimension because the transcendent can be experienced in this dimension. The transcendent is not something that is beyond all experience. For beyond experience, there's actually nothing that can be thought of. There's nothing that will be left for us. So Marshall insisted that there must exist a possibility of having an experience of the transcendent as such. And unless the possibility exists, the word can have no meaning. Meaning the transcendent can have no meaning. The tendency to discount the idea of experiencing transcendence is the result of an objective view of experience. However, experience is not an object. And therefore, it cannot be viewed objectively. The essence of experience is not an absorbing into oneself, as in the case of taste, but in straining oneself towards something. As when, for instance, during the night, we attempt to get a distinct perception of some far off noise. Thus, while Marcel insists on the possibility of experiencing the transcendent, he does not thereby mean that the transcendent is comprehensible. It is something that we cannot really comprehend. There is an order where the subject finds himself in the presence of something beyond, entirely beyond his comprehension or his grasp. Transcendence designates the absolute, the unbridgeable chasm yawning between the subject and being, insofar as being invades every attempt to pin it down. Because the more you try to comprehend it, the more that you are unable to grasp it. Now, the distinction between having and being. First, having is our normal mode of relating to the world. For Marcel, it does not mean or it does not imply possessing or acquiring of possessions or acquiring something. Rather, it represents our stance, our way of dealing with our world of organizing and mastering it. Having is characterized by abstraction from the concrete reality. We try to objectify our world. We view it as an object that we can possess, that we can control. So we approach situations principally as problems to be solved. For example, we ask, how does this thing work? What is wrong with this? Or what does this person want? The basic relation becomes one of objectification, of manipulation, of control and domination. And in the case of persons, we tend to characterize or categorize them. The mode of relating which Marcel terms as being is completely opposite to that of having. 
and it is essential to our personal relationships and to our living richly human events. When one approaches the world with the attitude of being, that world appears as something that he participates in. That world is something that I participate in. I am immersed in it. And it appears to me not as an object, but as presence. I deal with the concrete experience and not the abstraction. Because abstraction is part of having. The world is something that is intimately related to me. I do not view the world in an objective and detached manner. Rather as something that I am part of. And others and the others that I encounter in this world are part of my experience. They are related to me in some personal indirect way. They are not objects that I can categorize or objectify and manipulate. Now, this is a famous expression of Marcel. I have a body. I am a body. And this is Marcel's unique way of illustrating the distinction between being and having. So, this having and being is bridged by the distinction between them, by the concept of my body. My body, insofar it is, as it is my body, is something that I have and something that I am. I can look at my body in a dissociated manner and see it instrumentally, view it objectively. And in doing so, I am distancing myself from my body in order to grasp it as object. So it ceases to be just my body. I can have a body, but it's, and yes, it's my body, but I consider it as something that I possess, something that I have. So I can have a body, but not my body. Now, as soon as I make the connection that the body in question, that the body I am observing objectively is actually my body and not just any kind of body, then it can no longer be something that I have. This body is already something that is also me. This body is what I am. So when I look at the mirror and I focus on this particular face, I treat what I see in the, in the mirror as one particular face, one particular body. And I can objectify the face I see in the mirror, which is a reflection of a body. But as soon as I realize that this reflection in the mirror, this face that I see in the mirror is actually me, then I recognize that this body is not just any body. It is actually me. So now I recognize that I am this body. I am a body. It's not just I have a body, but I am a body. The body that I see in front of me is me. So, this ambiguous role of my body and a body points out not only the distinction between being and having. It all shows that we relate to other things and persons differently in these two modes. Having corresponds to things that are completely external to me. I have things that I possess, things that I can dispose of things that I can use, things that I can manipulate, things that I can objectify. And this should make it clear that I cannot have, for example, 
another person. Because another person is not an object. So having implies this possession because having always implies an obscure notion of assimilation. We assimilate objects. We acquire objects. Now, while the encounter with otherness takes place in terms of assimilation, when speaking of having, the encounter with other persons can also take place in the level of being. So in this case, Marcel maintains that the encounter is not one that is purely external and as such, it is played, played out in terms of presence and participation rather than assimilation. So for Marcel, objects with the attitude of having are assimilated other people with the attitude of being we recognize their presence we participate with them this is very similar to buber's notion of becoming aware becoming aware of the presence of the person not in an objective and abstract way but in a more intimate direct personal participatory way. So, the having mode of relating is essential in many areas of our life. Like the it of Buber, it is essential in life. There is much in our everyday life that genuinely presents itself as a problem to be solved, things to be possessed, things to be have. Now, there is a genuine problem and must go about the normal logical thinking process to come up with some sort of solution. Because this is an objective problem that needs some solution. When we are faced with genuine problems, there's no other sane course but to maintain the attitude of having and seek a objective and logical solution. The problem is that since the mode of relating to the world is so prevalent and encouraged, it can become exclusive mode of awareness, particularly because it gives us so much control and security about our lives. It enables us to solve our problems, our concrete problems. Now, let's go to another point which is related to this problem and mystery. According to Marcel, the broken world is one that is, on the one hand, riddled with problems, and on the other hand, determined to allow no room for mystery. The denial of the mysterious, of the transcendental, is symptomatic of the modern world, and is tied to its technical character, which only acknowledges that which technique can address the problematic. Technology can address, can find solution to objective problems, to the problematic. The distinction between problem and mystery is one that hinges, like much of Marcel's thought, on the notion of participation or involvement. A problem is something which I meet meaning something that is external to me, which I find completely before me, external to me, but which I can therefore lay seeds, lay seeds to and reduce to something, categorize, objectify. But a mystery is something in which I am myself involved. And it can therefore be thought of as a sphere where the distinction between what is me and what is before me loses its meaning and initial validity. In the case of a problem, something is always before me, external to me. But in the case of the mystery, it is something that I am involved. So it's not something that is 
before me or external to me. A problem is a question in which I am not involved, in which the identity of the person, for example, asking the question is not an issue. In the realm of the problematic, it makes no difference who is asking the question because all of the relevant information is before the questioner. And as such, a problem is something that obstructs my way, placing an obstacle, an objective obstacle in front of me that must be overcome. In turn, the overcoming of a problem inevitably involves some kind of technique, a process, a method, a technique that could be and is often employed not just by one person, not just by me, who is confronted with the same problem. It is a technique, it is a solution, a process that can be employed, can be used by other people who face similar problems. And therefore, the identity of the questioner, the one who encounters a problem, can be changed without altering the problem itself. Now, this is why in modern world, in the modern broken world, we see the problematic. And the problematic is that which can be addressed and solved with a particular technique. So, for example, if you cannot withdraw money from the ATM machine when you need cash, then it can be fixed by some common general procedure. And everybody can utilize, can use that procedure whenever or wherever he cannot withdraw money from the ATM when he needs cash. So when I am dealing with a problem, I try to discover a solution that can become a common property, a solution that can be employed, applied by other people. And therefore, consequently, it can at least, in theory, be rediscovered by anybody. It can be used by anybody. Marcel stresses that a problem in, is, some, is in some way outside, external to us, something apart from our innate or intimate experience, and something towards which we adopt a merely impersonal, indirect attitude. And therefore, it can become an object of general knowledge and public inquiry. So, as objective, a problem confronts me in the manner of an obstacle which must be overcome. In scientific investigation, it seems possible to make a clear-cut distinction between the subject which interrogates and the object which is being interrogated or examined. Between what is me and what is before me. So, I can be objective. In this way, the problem emerges as something definite, specific, fixed pattern. And this is revealed through the way in which we believe that a given problem may be resolved in terms of a solution, a common solution, which can be tested and verified in experience. So there is that universal reason or thought in general capable of laying down certain conditions necessary for the acceptance of any particular solution as valid. So meaning we can generalize this solution. When those conditions have been sat satisfactorily fulfilled, we say that the solution has been verified. So it is normal to suppose that such verification is carried out by a mind of a depersonalized subject meaning a very objective mind, in that one investigator ought to be able to reach exactly the same conclusion as the other investigator. So this is an essential condition for the establishment of a certain kind of objective knowledge. Again, that is not something wrong. We do that. Science does that. Now, what about the mystery. Marcel describes the mystery as a problem that encroaches 
on its own data. What does it mean? Such a problem, in fact, is a meta-problematic. It is beyond the problematic. It is a question in which the identity of the questioner is an issue. Because this problem cannot be transferred to another person. When this problem, this meta-problematic, is transferred to another person, it becomes another, a different problem altogether. So, on the level of the mysterious, the identity of the questioner is tied up to the question, and therefore, the questioner is not interchangeable. So, it cannot be transferred to anyone. To change the questioner would be to alter the question. It makes every difference who is asking the question when confronting a mystery. So, for example, if you're going to ask about how I can get money, withdraw money from the ATM when the machine bugs down, you can get a solution, an answer that will be common to more or less everyone. But if the problem is, for example, how do we deal with the loss of someone? We cannot provide a general answer to that because it will depend on the one, on the person involved. So Mars insists that mysteries can be found in the question of being, that is ontological exigence, the union of the body and soul, the problem of evil, and perhaps the archetypal examples of mystery is freedom and love. So for example, I cannot question being as if my being is not an issue in the questioning. The question of being and the question of who I am, my being, cannot be addressed separately. So if I am asked what is being, what is my being, I am involved in the question. If somebody is asked about his being, he is involved in the question. So the question takes a whole meaning when asked to different people because the questioner is involved. So these two questions are somehow incoherent if approached as problems. However, taken together, their mysterious character is revealed and they cancel themselves out as problems. So they are not problematic. Unlike problems, mysteries are not solved with techniques and therefore cannot be answered by the same, in the same way by different persons employing just one technique or one solution. It will not apply in different cases presented by different persons. So if a person encounters a family problem, that problem will be different. His situation will be different from other person who may encounter also a family problem. Because the person is involved in the problem. So when we talk about life, life is a mystery. We have our own lives. We encounter problems in our lives, personal problems. And we employ different, we get different meanings from these problems or from these mystery, mysteries. So although a mystery may be insoluble, it's something that cannot be solved. It is not senseless altogether. And while its inexpressibility makes it inaccessible to communicable knowledge, it can still be broken or it can still be spoken in a suggest suggestive way. Marcel does not intend to be something arcane, for it to be something arcane, and totally incomprehensible. Mystery denotes the complexity and depth of all reality. As Marcel puts it, mysteries are not truths that lie beyond us. They are truths that comprehend us. The world is a mystery. 
because I am immersed in it and I am comprehended by it. I can never grasp it in its totality, but only in terms of my immediate experience and the memory of past experience. There is always more not yet experience, not yet comprehended. So relationships from this mode of relating are the I thou quality, rich in their possibilities and becoming. And from this mode of relating, one begins to open up the richness of experience and of other persons. The mystery of being brings us to the region of the metaproblematical, the metaproblematic, where it is necessary to transcend the opposition of subject which would affirm being and of being which is affirmed by this subject. The very antithesis involved in the subject-object relationship is only possible in the first place through the existence of of a meta-problematical sphere which gives priority to being over knowledge. Problems are addressed impersonally, in a detached manner, while mysteries demand participation and involvement. And although some problems can be reflected, can be reflected on in such a way that they become mysterious, all mysteries can be reflected on in such a way that the mystery is degraded and becomes merely problematic. Now, let's go to the second concept of Marcel, the primary and secondary reflections. Marcel's distinction between problem and mystery brings to light two different kinds of thinking or two different kinds of reflection. The problematic is addressed with thinking that is analytical, detached, and technical, while the mysterious is encountered in reflection that is involved, imaginative, participatory, personal, and definitely non-technical. And Marcel calls these two kinds of thinking or reflection as primary and secondary reflections. Primary reflection is characterized as abstract, analytical, objective, universal, and verifiable. So it can properly be applied to the sciences. The thinking subject is pri in primary reflection is not the individual human person, but a thinker qua mind meaning a thinking subject. Okay. Primary reflection deals with the realm of the problematic. As the etymology of problem, probalo, suggests, the distinguishing feature of the problematic approach to reality is the separation of the questioner from the data about which he questions. So there is always the separation between the questioner and the question and the data presented in the question. The data of primary reflection lies in the public domain. Everybody can know, can have access to this data and are equally available to any qualified observer. Once a problem is posed, primary reflection proceeds to abstract from the concrete data any elements that are not relevant to the solution of the problem under consideration. And when a solution or an explanation has been found, the original curiosity and the tension that motivated the thinker to inquire are now alleviated. The problem is solved. Primary reflection examines its object by abstraction, by analytically breaking it down into its constituent parts. It is concerned with definitions, essences, and technical solutions to problems. In contrast, secondary reflection is synthetic, meaning it unifies rather than divides. Roughly, 
we can say that where primary reflection tends to dissolve the unity of experience, which is first be put before it, the function of secondary reflection is to put them back together. It's essentially recuperative. It reconquers that unity. It puts together all the parts. It reconquers the unity of the experience. So, primary reflection is directed at that which is outside of me or before me, while secondary reflection is directed at that which is merely before me, which is not, not merely before me, that is, either that which is in me, which I am, or those areas where the distinction in me and before me tend to break down. So, there's no distinction between what is in me or before me. Because there, there is a unity of these elements. Primary reflection is simplified in scientific and technical thought. It allows us to possess and manipulate our world and more completely and is therefore indispensable to human culture. So we're saying that that is important. It's essential to life. However, intellectual and moral confusion results when Primary reflection becomes imperialistic and claims the right to judge all knowledge and truth by criteria appropriate only to the realm of the objective and the problematic. Secondary reflection is concrete, individual, heuristic, and open. Strictly speaking, it is concerned not with objects but with presences. Its completion begins not with curiosity, its contemplation begins not with curiosity or doubt, but with wonder, with astonishment. So there is reflection in the secondary, the real meaning of reflection. Hence, it is humble in its willingness to be conformed to categories created by that on which it is focused. It remains open to its object not as a specimen of a class or a category, but as a unique being. This openness is not a methodological principle, as in the case of scientific thought, but it arises from the possibility of something new being created in that relationship. Secondary reflection is dialogical, not dialectical. Rather than searching for information about the other and dealing with it abstractly, secondary reflection seeks the revelation of total presence. Whether the presence, whether the presence be that of my body, the presence of the world, or of another person, or God. And therefore, secondary reflection is brought to bear on data or questions from which a thinker, as existing person, cannot legitimately abstract himself. So questions like, am I free? Or is there meaning and value in my life? Can I commit myself to this person? These are questions that cannot be detached from the one asking the question. So secondary reflection is one important aspect of our access to the self. It is the it is properly philosophical mode of reflection because philosophy must return to concrete situations if it is to merit the name philosophy. These difficult reflections are properly philosophical insofar as they lead to a more fruitful, more intimate communication with both self and with any other person whom these reflections include. Secondary reflection, which recoups the unit of experience, points the way toward a fuller understanding of participation in the mysterious. So when we engage in primary reflection alone and abandon the synthesizing, recollecting, 
and recouping aspect of secondary reflection, we fall victim to the spirit of obstruction. As soon as we accord to any category, isolated from all other categories, an arbitrary primacy, we are victims of the spirit of abstraction, according to Marcel. Abstraction, which is in essence a kind of thinking that characterize, or characterizes primary reflection, is not always bad per se. But abstraction, which is always abstraction, from an embodied concrete existence, meaning detached from this concrete existence, can overcome our concrete existence. And we may come to view abstracted elements of existence as if they were independent. So, the parallels between having and being, problem and mystery, and primary and secondary reflections, are clear. Each pair helping to illuminate the other. Now, let's go to the next concept of Marcel. Disponibility and indisponibility. For Marcel, there are two general ways of comporting ourselves towards others or relating with the others, which can be use as barometers of intersubjective relationships. And these are disponibility or availability and indisponibility or unavailability. The term disponibility refers to the measure in which I am available to someone. The state of having my resources at hand to offer. My presence to offer. And this availability or unavailability of resources is a general state or disposition. Indisponibility or inavailability can manifest itself in a number of ways. However, unavailability is rooted in some measure of alienation. Pride is an instructive example of indisponibility. And pride for myself is not just an exaggerated opinion about oneself, about self-love. Rather, pride consists in believing that one is sufficient. It consists in drawing one's strength from oneself. It consists in closing oneself from others because one believes that he can be sufficient alone. According to Marcel, the proud man is cut off from a certain kind of communion with his fellow man, which pride, acting as a principle of destruction, tends to break down. Indeed, this destructiveness can be equally well directed against the self. Pride is in no way incompatible with self-hate. For a person who is indisponible, other people are reduced to examples or cases of genus of other persons, rather than being encountered as other, as unique individuals. So instead of encountering the other person as a Tao, the other is encountered either as a he or she, or even a it. So if I treat Tao as a he or she, or even an it, I reduce the other as simply a sample of nature, an animated object which, which works in some way and not in others. If, on the contrary, I treat the other as a Tao, I treat him and apprehend him as freedom, as someone. I become available to the person. I take the attitude of disponibility. So the other insofar as his other only exists for me insofar as I am open to him. I am available to him. Insofar as he is a Tao to me. But I am only open to him insofar as I 
cease to form a circle with myself, inside which I somehow place the other, or rather his idea. Because inside this circle, the other becomes just an idea of the other. And the idea of the other is no longer the other as other, but rather as an other that is related to me. Some an other that I can assimilate like an object. So when I treat the other as a her, as an it, as a he or his, I treat her, him, it, not as presence, but as absent. However, when I treat the other as a he or she rather than a thou, I become incapable of seeing myself as a thou also. In indisputability, I am not present to the other, to the other person, and I am closed off and indifferent to the presence of the other or that the other offers me. However, in encountering the other person in this manner, I encounter him not as another person, but just as an example of certain functions, certain roles, or certain characteristics. Maybe just another token distributor, maybe just another teacher, maybe just another student, but not as an other, not as a doubt. So in, in this in disponibility, I am open and available to others. In contrast, the characteristics of the soul which is present and at disposal of others is that it cannot think in terms of cases. In its eyes, there are no cases at all. The person who is disponible is available or disposable to others. He has an entirely different experience of her place in the world. She acknowledges her interdependence with other people. Relationships of disponibility are characterized by presence and communication between person as other, qua freedom. A communication and communion between persons who transcend their separation without merging into a unity. Because even in that relationship, we maintain our subjectivity, our independence. While remaining separate and interdependent to some degree. This means that being self-contained or compact, impenetrable mass, but being open and exposed to the other. Marcel characterizes disponibility as charity bound up with presence, as the gift of oneself to the other. And therefore, at the extreme limit, disponibility would consist in a total spiritual availability that would be pure charity, unconditional love, and disposability. Now, two concepts related to this. The first one is the term with. With is the word that describes the relationship between or among disponible person. The word with, taken with its full metaphysical implication, corresponds neither to a relationship of separation or exteriority, nor a relationship of unity and inherence. It is rather the genuine, the essence of genuine co-essence. To exist is to coexist for Marcel. That means a kind of pluralism, separation with communion. If indisponibility is illustrated with the example of pride, disponibility is best illustrated in the relationship of love, of hope, and fidelity. Because it is in love and hope and fidelity that we are one with other persons. The other concept is reciprocity. Marcel is, you know, for Marcel, it is not enough for one person to be disponible in order for the full communion of disponibility to, to occur. It is possible 
for one person to come to an encounter in a completely open and available manner, only to be ignored or rebuffed by the total unavailability or indisponibility of the other person. Ideally, a relationship of availability or disponibility must include the element of reciprocity. However, although reciprocity is necessary in an intersubjective relationship, it does not mean that reciprocity may be demanded of such relationship. Of course, in the ideal setting, there must be reciprocity. Disponibility, according to Marcel, does not insist on its own right or make any claim on the other whatsoever. It simply waits for the favor, for the generosity of the other for reciprocity. So I do not make myself available to other people because I expect them to be available to us or available to me. When I make myself available to other people, I wait. I hope. However, reciprocity must be present if the relationship is to prosper more fully. Now, another concepts, three concepts here that would introduce our next set of concepts that we're going to discuss are opinion, conviction, and belief. So let's just define these three. Opinion always concerns that which we do not know, that with which we are not familiar. It is between impression and affirmation. Often opinions may have false basis, like in the case of stereotypes and prejudices. They are unreflective and invariably external to the things to which they refer. Convictions, on the other hand, are more akin to belief than opinion. They are the result of extensive reflection and invariably concern things to which one feels closely tied. Like opinions that have entrenched themselves to the point of becoming actual claims, convictions are felt to be definitive beyond modification. So when you're convinced of something, that's it. However, when I claim that nothing can change my conviction, I must either affirm that I have already anticipated all possible future scenarios and no possible event can change my conviction, or affirm that whatever events do occur, anticipated or unanticipated, they will not shake my conviction. I will stand by my conviction. Now, lastly, belief as faith or faith as belief. Marcel distinguished two types of beliefs, believing that and believing in. To believe in something is to extend credit to it. To place something at the disposal of that in which we believe. So to believe that is simply to believe that something is this. But the more profound is to believe in to believe in because when we believe in something we place ourselves at its disposal but we believe that we can change that belief now let's go to creative fidelity keep in mind our idea of believing in Fidelity is a belief in someone. It requires presence in addition to constancy over time. So to be faithful is not just to be over there. It must always be that we are always present to the other. And presence implies an effective element. So mere constancy over time is not enough because a fulfillment of an objection that is against the heart, no, country core, devoid of love, cannot be identified with fidelity. The problem then posed by fidelity is not is that of constancy. 
that you will always be there. Fidelity, faithful. The mystery of fidelity is the question of commitment, of commitment of a time. So how are we able to remain disponible, available to someone, to a person over time? And how can we provide a guarantee of our belief in someone, of our faith in someone? Marcel insists that if there is a possible assurance of fidelity, it is because disposability or disponibility and creativity are related ideas. To be disposable is to believe in the other, to place myself at her disposal, and to maintain the openness of disponibility. Creative fidelity consists in actively maintaining ourselves in a state of openness, of permeability, in willing ourselves to remain open to the other and open to the influx of the presence of the other. The truest fidelity is creative. That is, a fidelity that creates the self in order to, deba to, to meet the demands of fidelity. Such fidelity interprets the vicissitudes of belief in as a temptation to infidelity and sees them in terms of a test of the self rather than in terms of a betrayal by the other if fidelity fails. So, it is my failure rather than the failure of the other. However, fidelity is always open to doubt. I can always call into question the reality of the bond that links me to another person. Always begin to doubt the presence of the other person to whom I am faithful, substituting for her presence an idea of my own making. On the other hand, the more disposed I am toward the ontological affirmation, the affirmation of being, the more I am inclined to see the failure of fidelity as my failure, resulting from my insufficiency rather than from that of the other. According to Marcel, the ground of fidelity that necessarily seems precarious to us as soon as we commit ourselves to another who is unknown seems, on the other hand, unshakable when it is based not to be sure on a distinct apprehension of God or someone, but on a certain appeal delivered from the depths of my own insufficiency. And this is where hope comes in. We can always put some doubts to fidelity. But if there is hope, hope becomes the final guarantor of fidelity. It is that which allows me not to despair, not to think of what if, what if, what if I cannot be present constantly. Or that the other person cannot be present to me every time. So hope is that which gives me the strength to continue to create myself in availability to the other person. The essence of hope is not to hope that X will do this or will do that, but simply to hope. The person who hopes does not accept the current situation as final. However, nor does she or he imagines or anticipate the circumstance that would deliver her from her plight. Rather, than, rather, she merely hopes for deliverance. That's why for Marcel, faith, fidelity, and hope are tightly connected. The more hope transcends 
any anticipation of the form that deliverance would take, the less it is open to the objection that, in many cases, the hope for deliverance does not take place. Of course, this does not mean that hope is inert and passive, that it is just waiting. Hope is not a stoicism. What will be, will be. Stoicism is mere resignation of a solitary consciousness. Hope is neither resigned nor solitary. Hope consists in asserting that there is in the heart of being, beyond all data, beyond all inventories, beyond all calculation, a mysterious principle which is in connivance with me. A mysterious principle which is in connivance with me. So while hope is patient and expectant, it remains active. And as such, it might be characterized as an active patience. Metaphysically, the only genuine hope is hope in what does not depend on ourselves. Hope is springing from humility and not pride. Faith and God and love. So, we were talking of belief in a person, fidelity to another person, but there's also fidelity and belief in God. And this is essential because of the risk and uncertainty of that mode of hope, of that mode of being brings with it. For Marcel, it is essential that we believe that in the, the underlying the whole of reality is the ever-present and loving God who has created and cares for this world. But that belief rests upon and is fleshed out by my attitude of love, which is fundamental movement in this in the stance of being. Join our view or join with our view of the world as a mystery. To believe is the volitional disposition of love by which one gives oneself to that encompassing world. Love as opposed to desire is regarded as the subordination of the self to a superior reality, to God. By love, Marcel does not intend some simple affection or emotion. But rather, it is a radical disposition which acknowledges a superior or higher reality in most individual to subordinate himself or herself to that superior reality, to God. That reality is both the divine and the totality of beings in all its richness and mystery. The disposition of subordination is in itself a profound act of abandonment, relinquishing the superiority of the rational self in acknowledgement of an even higher reality. Such a love demands that I give myself over to, okay, uh, myself over to be at the disposal of the other. I am totally for the becoming of the other. And finally, his notion of freedom. According to Marcel, the objection of the self through one's processions robs one of his freedom and separates him from the experience of his own participation in being. The idolatrous world of perverted possessions may be abandoned if the true reality of humanity is to be reached. It must be abandoned if the true reality of humanity is to be reached. The experience of freedom cannot be achieved unless the subject extricates himself from the grip of egoism or egocentrism. Because freedom is not simply doing what desire dictates. The person who sees himself as autonomous within himself has a freedom based on ill-fated egocentrism. 
He errs in believing freedom to be rooted in independence. That is not the freedom that Marcel is talking about. For Marcel, freedom is both the negative, is understood in the negative and the positive sense. Negatively, freedom is the absence of whatever resembles an alienation from oneself. And positively, when the motives of my actions are within the limits of what I can legitimately consider as a structural traits of myself. Freedom then is always about the possibilities of the self, understood within the confines of relationships with others. So Marcel's freedom is tied to the raw experience of the body, and it is something that always needs to be experienced. The self is fully free when it is submerged in the possibilities of the self and the needs of others. Although all humans have basic autonomous freedom, in virtue of their embodiment and consciousness, only those persons who seek to experience being by freely engaging with other free beings can break out the facticity of the body and into the fulfillment of being. The free act is significant because it contributes to defining the self. And therefore, Marcel says, by freedom, I am given back to myself. That ends our discussion or my presentation on the philosophy of Marcel. Thank you very much for listening. This is Job Aguas once again.